Uh, here's the information slide with the Sophie seminar webpage with the upcoming seminars, email to subscribe for updates down at the bottom of the screen. All right, welcome everybody to today's Sophie seminar. I'm Andrew Patton, the organizer of the series. Today, I'm very happy to host Roger Quaidveig from Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Uh, his discussant will be Peter Hansen from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We'll follow the usual format, 40 minutes for the speaker, 10 to 15 for the discussant, and then five or 10 for questions from the audience. And then if the questions spill over the one hour mark, we'll, um, we'll end the recording and we'll move over to the, to the hangout session and continue it all there. If you have questions during the seminar, you can either use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or you can use the raise your hand feature and I'll just call on you to ask your question uh, yourself. And with that, I'll turn it over to, to Roger. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, let me quickly hide all the stuff so no gray boxes appear or should appear. Uh, and, uh, of course, I'm clicking all the wrong buttons. Great start. This is good. This just reminds everybody that we don't want to be on Zoom for much longer. And so like that should work. Okay, so uh, once again, thank you and thank you all for uh, being here. So this paper is a joint work with Jali and Jiping Liao and uh, it's called Conditional Superior Predictive Ability. And basically, it's a, a forecast comparison paper. So in order to really show what, we, what we're going to be talking about, what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to start with a quick overview of uh, what has kind of been done there in the past 25 years uh, in terms of things that are important to understand what's going on. So we're just going to start, or I'm just going to start off straight with what really is the most popular way of comparing forecasts uh, uh, in the literature. And the basic uh, approach that most people take and is basically used in every single forecasting paper that, that is out there, I think it's at nearly eight, 9,000 sites now, uh, is the so-called Diebold Mariano test. So it's a very popular uh, forecast comparison method. And really what we're trying to find out there is whether two models have uh, uh, the same unconditional forecasting performance. So it's a very simple test to, to carry out. The idea is that uh, we have a, two sets of forecasts. We have a certain loss function in mind. We compute a time series of the different losses. Uh, subsequently, we get uh, create a time series of the loss uh, differences, so a sequence of the loss differences, uh, get the mean, do a hack inference on it, and essentially using a very simple t-test, we find out whether the forecasting performance is equal or whether one model performs better than the other. Uh, more generally, you can, of course, do this with uh, not just two models, but you can do this with uh, any number of models. And uh, these are essentially models of unconditional equal predictive ability. Uh, since then, uh, we've seen for the, uh, or in terms of uh, things that are gonna be very helpful for us, we've seen uh, improvements and sort of extensions in two important directions. So the first one is uh, to go from unconditional equal to unconditional superior predictive ability. So here what we're doing is essentially we're not testing whether two models are better or are equal to each other, but we go from to a setting where we want to find out whether a certain benchmark model is uh, outperforms a collection of competing models. Um, so this, uh, this null hypothesis is then essentially going to be described by a set of moment inequalities. And the idea is that uh, we, we end up in a situation that's uh, econometrically a little bit more difficult. We're no longer talking about these simple hypotheses. We're talking about composite hypotheses. They typically depend on all kinds of nuisance parameters that are then uh, solved by using a bootstrap. And the first one to really come up with this idea was uh, White's reality check paper. And he proposes critical values under the least favorable null. And uh, Peter Hansen, my kind discussant, uh, sort of refines that test by proposing a, a pre-selection of inferior models to really get rid of models that are very clearly much, much worse than uh, the benchmark model, which uh, improves power and the power of the test significantly. And that's an idea that actually we're also going to borrow uh, in this paper. The second direction that this uh, unconditional equal predictability test was extended to is into the conditional equal predictability direction. This was put forward by Giacomini and White in 2006. And there the idea is that uh, we're no longer testing whether two models are the same on average, but we're testing whether they're the same 
essentially in all possible conditioning states. So we have a certain conditioning variable. Uh, the easiest one to think of is something like a recession indicator, really a zero one dummy, but they can also be uh, uh, continuous. And where this test essentially entails not just whether one, uh, one method is better on average, but also when this occurs. So really what we're uh, assuming or the, under the null, the two models are identically the same or have identically the same performance across all of the different conditioning states and the alternative states that, well, during some states, one model is definitely uh, different from the other. So this is especially going to be helpful when uh, uh, we've settled on a set of all very competitive models that unconditionally all seem to work pretty much the same. But uh, when we start to look a little bit more carefully and look at conditional expectations, we might be able to uh, distinguish these models. And uh, in particular, what that then, then helps us is to uh, sort of fine tune our, our models and get some better idea of when models perform very well and when they do not. Econometrically, however, this is again uh, uh, a big step forward uh, or might be a big step forward from the standard de and mariana test. We no longer have a simple t-test because we're dealing here with uh, conditional expectation functions. And uh, the test really, or the hypothesis really pertains to sort of really how this full function behaves over the entire conditioning uh, range. And as such, we usually would have a, a functional inference problem. Uh, but the nice thing is that in this setting, that whole difficult functional inference problem may be completely avoided by simply looking at the number of the unconditional moments that are implied by these conditional equality moments. And as such, the conditional equal predictability test can still be uh, implemented using a, a finite dimensional uh, unconditional equal predictive ability type uh, operation. So essentially just using a standard wall test. So we have the standard Deep Boulder Mariano test that has really been uh, extended in these two important directions. And that is kind of where we come in then. In this paper, we, uh, we combine these ideas or maybe I would like to say uh, sort of synergize these two ideas of the superior predictive ability and the conditional part of the, uh, the Giacomini wide test. Um, into something that we call conditional superior predictive ability test. And then of course, uh, this is kind of the last one in the, in the quadrant that I just sort of set out. So the null is quite obvious. What we are, what we are after here is that we have a certain benchmark model and uh, we wanna find out whether that benchmark model is beaten by any of the alternative models at some or at any of the uh, condition states. So it's quite a, a stringent hypothesis in the sense that really it should be rejected uh, as soon as there's even a single model that during just one small period of time uh, proxied by th that conditioning variable uh, where it performs worse. So it should be uh, uh, beating the test is really uh, quite a desirable feature for a model. Uh, the nice thing is that the way that we set up the testing procedure, uh, we actually uh, sort of as a byproduct of how, how we estimate it, we find out which method and in which states might, so in case we do reject, we find out which methods and in which states uh, those alternative models actually perform better, which means that we might be able to actually learn something about how, the way our model operates and think about how we might uh, generate future models or how we might design future models. So in this case, uh, we cannot get rid of that, fun that functional inference problem and indeed we tackle it head on. And the way that we're gonna do that is I'm gonna so give you a sort of a quick sneak peek uh, about the way that, that, that it's gonna work. So basically we're gonna be estimating these conditional expected loss functions using uh, series uh, regressions. Uh, and subsequently we use, uh, or we adapt the, uh, the intersection bounds methodology of Chernozik of Lee and Rosen that was originally developed in the uh, microeconometrics IID setting uh, to do inference on that uh, on that functional or on that estimate of the conditional expected loss function. And uh, so this, uh, this approach was already generalized to a time series setting uh, for mixing gills uh, in an earlier paper by my two co-authors. But in this setting or in this paper, we uh, essentially relax or weaken the assumptions necessary for both that, uh, that theory and the, uh, so, so for both the mixing gill theory and for the intersection bound kind of theory. I'm going to show you a little bit more details on that later on. But uh, in this presentation, uh, also given the, the 40 minutes, I'm really mainly going to focus on pushing this idea of the, the conditional superior predictability tests and how it works and how we can use it. Okay, so for the uh, next 30 minutes or so, 
what I'm going to be talking about. So first, I'm going to give you a formal introduction of the conditional superior predictability test. I'm going to show you a little bit of simulation evidence in terms of uh, uh, that can very clearly highlight how the test works and when it works well uh, by uh, uh, in a in a structured DGP. And then I'm going to give you uh, time permitting two empirical applications. One really financial econometrics application where I'm forecasting volatility, and one a little bit more microfinance uh, setting where I'm going to be looking at forecasting inflation. So, uh, first, a little bit of notation. So, we have a time series FT, uh, and we have a certain benchmark forecast that we're going to index F0T and capital J competing methods uh, that are all going to be FJT. There is a certain loss function. We don't have to make any statement on, loss on what loss function that is. And uh, we're essentially going to be focusing on these sequences of loss differentials. So YJT is the loss of model J minus the loss of the benchmark model. So that means if YJT is greater than zero, then essentially the benchmark model is outperforming the alternative model and vice versa. So uh, while this seems like it's just a little bit of notation, I should note here that uh, the fact that we're going to be focusing on really these loss differentials puts us firmly in sort of the Diebold and Mariano and Giacomini White uh, side of things in the sense that we take these loss differentials really as primitives. So we uh, are really comparing full forecasting methods uh, in contrast to something that, uh, so the, the alternative approach taken, for instance, or essentially set out by uh, West in his 1996 econometrical paper uh, that really looks at forecasting performance of models uh, in uh, the, at the population level predictive uh, ability in the sense that uh, how would these models compare if we had the true parameters? Here, we're really interested in some of this finite, level, finite uh, sample uh, uh, predictive ability in the sense as we have a certain forecasting method. This includes both the model, this includes the rolling window length, and uh, this is feasibly kind of the forecasting performance that we may reach. And uh, that is the, the, the kind of setting that we're comparing forecasting models. In. So given that YJT, we can rephrase and uh, succinctly summarize the kind of hypothesis that I've been talking about up until now. So the Diebold Mariano test simply says that thing is on average zero for all J. The uh, superior predictive ability version says that thing is greater or equal to zero for all J. Giacomino White says the conditional expectation of YJT is zero for all X's and for all J. And we come here with the conditional superior predictive ability hypothesis. Tip. And that essentially says it's greater or equal to zero. Uh, the conditional expectation is greater or equal to zero for all x's and for all j. Now, once again, want to really reaffirm that these conditional hypotheses are fundamentally different from the unconditional counterparts, and uh, in particular, uh, much more tricky to evaluate econometrically because they involve this inference on these full functions, right? We've got hj of uh, so this conditional expectation function. I'm going to rewrite it here also a little bit to emphasize that we're talking about functional inference as really a function hj of x so that is the, this is the conditional expectation of the loss difference evaluated at x relative to model j uh, and indeed these hypotheses can equivalently be rewritten in this hj format right the equal predictive ability hypothesis is simply that this thing is zero for all x and j conditional superior predictability is that this thing is greater than equal uh, to zero for all j and all x. And so tackling this functional inference problem is uh, uh, really a, a different uh, approach than uh, the standard uh, uh, equal predictability ones. So quickly want to uh, sort of highlight how Giacomini and White in their uh, original conditional equal predictability test were able to, to bypass that functional inference problem and really walk around it by uh, essentially what they did was they tested this Martingale difference sequence uh, implication of the null hypothesis that these would be equal to zero. And of course, this thing here can very easily be evaluated with just a standard wall test without having to really go into any functional inference. So here we are actually going to do that. And uh, again, let me get here a little bit into details on how we do that, how we approach this functional inference problem. So we do that by estimating these uh, conditional expectations functions h, j, x directly. Uh, we do that using a series regression. And uh, we then we use these, these recent inference methods for function for uh, conditional moment inequalities to conduct inference on, on these h, j functions. 
So in particular, we're building on uh, these two uh, papers. First is this intersection bound method of genotic Lee and Rosen. And the second is the time series version uh, that uh, allows to do all of that in the mixing gill setting. So basically the problem here is that this functional inference problem uh, is generally uh, what's called non-Donsker. And what that means is that the usual weak convergence central limit theorems, uh, they don't really apply, they don't hold. And what you need is a, a, a strong approximation of the process. And that is essentially what is established in this Chernozka, Lee and Rosen paper and the Lee and Yao paper using what's called the Urinsky coupling. And uh, so basically that is the, uh, the approach that we're gonna be uh, taking here. So similar to that intersection bounds approach, we're gonna rewrite this conditional superior predictability hypothesis uh, basically by focusing on just one point on that whole functional inference space or on the whole uh, conditional, expected, uh, conditional expectation loss difference uh, sequence. I'm gonna be looking at this eta star here. So the eta star is the infimum across X and J's. And it's essentially uh, where our benchmark model is has the worst performance uh, relative to all of the alternative models and uh, across the different conditioning states. And then obviously if that eta star point is uh, below zero, that means that such a point exists where our model is beaten by a competitive model and therefore we should reject the hypothesis. So we're gonna be focusing on that eta point. So we have to somehow identify that eta point and we have to build a confidence bound around that. So how do we implement that in practice? So first estimate these HJ functions non-parametrically. So in order to do that, we set up, we uh, let these PX be uh, a set of basis functions. So the PX are essentially, they're gonna be transformations of the conditioning variable. Uh, you can think about uh, simple polynomials, you can think about uh, wavelets, you can think about all kinds of sinusoids, uh, whatever. And the idea is that that set of basis functions is gonna be increasing as our sample size increases, such that uh, whenever we, uh, whenever that the dimension of the set of basis functions starts to increase, we are gonna essentially approximate our HJ function, our conditional expectation function uh, arbitrarily well. And then we're gonna do, we essentially doing a least square series regression. So the next thing looks exactly like OLS. Um, we're essentially gonna estimate uh, a coefficient here, beta, which is uh, roughly the equivalent of X prime X, X prime inverse, where X is now our P of X, the transformed uh, set of basis functions, and uh, YJT are our lost differences. And then our functional, functional estimator is really just sort of the fitted value of that series regression, right? The set of basis functions times our estimated coefficients. So this looks like we're just doing OLS. Uh, when you code it, it's just OLS. But what it's uh, the sort of underlying, what we really have is that the set of basis functions is going to keep on growing with uh, the dimension of our problem. So once we've estimated our uh, conditional expectation function, next step is to do inference on it. For that, I need to define a couple more quantities. So B star, I'm gonna be, uh, be the, what is sort of the equivalent of a population uh, regression coefficient, but now in the series setting. So we need uh, essentially this condition on what that B star is. Uh, UT is a non-parametric regression error. So essentially just the residual. And we have A over N of A of N is just the long run covariance matrix of uh, what's essentially uh, X prime U. Now, we don't quite have X prime U here, but we have this UT Kronecker P of XT. And the Kronecker comes from the fact that we are dealing here with uh, J possible competing models. And they all are essentially regressed on this same set of basis functions, right? So we really get sort of this sort of block structure in that covariance matrix where uh, uh, on the diagonal, we have blocks uh, associated with each of the individual competing models. And uh, they're all essentially related through the same uh, P of X for, through the same set of series regression or basis functions. So given that we have those definitions, uh, we can feasibly estimate these things. So we need some kind of suitable Huck estimator for, a, for the long run covariance matrix. Of course, there's a little bit more tricky here because uh, we're talking about this growing dimensional setting. So the usual theory uh, 
and the usual approaches that we may take may not be uh, completely valid. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, then we can estimate the covariance matrix of the Bs, uh, so the estimated series regression coefficients using our usual sandwich estimator. Uh, like I said before, this thing can be nicely partitioned in blocks that are associated with each of the individual uh, alternative models. And as such, uh, we can then very simply construct a standard deviation function. So we have this sigma, uh, which is again indexed by j and x, so for competing method j and uh, at conditioning value x, uh, associated with the conditional expected uh, loss difference function h hat j of x uh, is then simply essentially, uh, since h j is p times b, we essentially get p b, b prime p, uh, the usual uh, uh, variance of the, the fitted values. So this way we can construct a standard deviation function associated with the uh, estimated uh, conditional expectation function. And as such, we can also uh, create a associated t-statistic uh, process. So given that we have all of that, this is then how we are uh, going to do the actual conditional superior predictability test. So at first, the first step is to, uh, we're going to simulate loads of uh, Gaussian random variables with covariance matrix, uh, this omega n. Recall this omega n is essentially the uh, long run covariance matrix of the B coefficients. So we're going to estimate uh, or simulate many, many uh, samples of that. And uh, so that's going to proxy the distribution of B. And as such, we can create uh, 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 or we generate sequence or sequences of T star, which essentially mimic the law of the T statistic process associated with, with the original H J hat uh, by simply, again, computing the P uh, times our new random size divided by the standard deviation. So this is how we uh, essentially proxy the distribution of the t-stats and from that we can get the appropriate critical values that are needed to find out how to reject at the proper level. Now the next step that we're going to do and I already hinted at that is to do this adaptive inequality selection. So what we uh, do here is essentially we try to first get rid of very very poor alternatives. So the idea is that we have to, uh, at some point, so we have to decide, uh, or we have to conduct inference, of course, on this full function, but we're really interested in this eta point. And uh, the close, so if we knew exactly where eta was, we could do, of course, very, very simple inference because we're only looking at that single point. Uh, but the greater our region is that we really have to search for that eta, the uh, less powerful uh, our test is gonna be. And uh, as such, what you would like to do is to, uh, first sort of shrink that uh, area over competing models J and conditioning variables and conditioning states X to uh, uh, as small as possible while still being sure that eta is really in there. So we can take a very, very high quantile and essentially we remove any pairs of J and X for which we're uh, sure that the infimum is not in there. So we construct this set V and which are all pairs of J and X that uh, with probability one uh, contain the infimum. So this is a smaller set that is essentially des uh, designed to increase power of the procedure. So after having done that, we have our, our smaller set and discarded the very, very weak alternatives. Uh, we can construct our upper bound by getting uh, uh, the appropriate critical value K hat as the one minus alpha quantile of the uh, distribution of the T star statistics. Remember, these are the ones that we simulated here, but only over those J and X that are actually in the selected uh, set. And then we simply construct uh, our uh, upper envelope, HJ of X plus our, uh, so the conditional expectation function plus the quantile times the standard deviation function. And we look at the, uh, the infimum over that curve and find out whether or not that thing is below zero, because indeed, if that thing is below zero, that means that some part of the confidence bound is below zero. And we found a place in the JX space that uh, where an alternative model has beaten our benchmark model. Okay, so validity of the test uh, is established. And for that, essentially, we need three assumptions. So the first 
is a, a valid hack estimator at the appropriate rate. So this might seem very standard, but it's not entirely standard. So the basic thing is that because we have the series regression here and we have this growing dimensional setting, we don't just need consistency of the hack estimator, but we also need it to converge at sufficient rate. Uh, it turns out that the standard Newey West type of estimator actually is perfectly suitable, but our simulation showed that uh, as with many uh, hack problems, uh, we're quite severely oversized. So what we do in this paper is uh, we use pre-widened uh, hack estimators. And uh, because it's quite tangential in the supplemental appendix, you can find all the details and all the proofs that uh, how to do this pre-widening in a growing dimensional setting. Um, so second is a rather standard set of series estimation assumptions. Uh, nothing too much special. And third, and this is where a large part of the theoretical contribution of this paper is, we need this strong approximation for the maximum projection. Well, so what does that mean? So like I said before, uh, for this, uh, basically for the, uh, this intersection bound theory uh, to work, uh, what originally uh, was needed was this strong uh, approximation for the entire uh, growing dimensional vector here, this UT uh, Kronecker PXT. So this was established in the IID setting uh, in the original paper via Urinsky's coupling. It was established by my co-authors in the mixing gill setting, also via Urinsky's coupling. But what it turns out is that then uh, you have quite some restrictive uh, uh, conditions on the growth rate of the number of basis functions. Uh, in particular, it can, it can go at one fifth uh, or sample size to the power of one, one over five. Uh, what we established in this paper is uh, a weaker or under a much weaker condition on the growth rate, we can show that uh, such a strong approximation for the maximum projection in a number of uh, directions exists. And moreover, that uh, this is really all that we need for that intersection bound procedure uh, to work. So the main advantage, so we lose, uh, we obviously make weaker assumptions and therefore this is also a weaker result than this, but uh, the main benefit of that is that our series terms can actually grow at a, a, a higher rate and all the intersection bound uh, uh, theory and methodology still goes through and we can still use it. So there's a large part of theory. I'm completely skipping over all of the details. There's a full section in the paper uh, if you're interested in, uh, in how to use this and where else to use it. It's purposefully written in a very general setting, uh, which is an application to our paper. Uh, because there might be much wider applicability than uh, the way that we've used it now. So validity of the test uh, is then established. So under these assumptions, one, two, and three, then we can show that the uh, conditional superior predictability test implemented as I just described uh, uh, essentially satisfies the following. It's gonna, uh, it has asymptotic size alpha. So uh, indeed under the null, the probability that we estimate this confidence bound to be small and zero is smaller or equal to alpha. And indeed, generally, it's gonna be quite conservative. It's gonna be smaller than alpha. And that uh, again has to do with the fact that we have to uncover this binding region uh, and don't have the single point that we can focus on. And on the alternative, uh, we have asymptotic power one. So one thing that I quickly wanna discuss before I go into simulations and empirics is that, um, so obviously one downside to these kinds of approaches is that you have to set a benchmark model, right? So I've got this uh, benchmark model F, F0 and all my alternative model is J. Well, so basically what I wanna say here is that making the choice is not really uh, that much of a problem here uh, because there turns out to be a very nice equivalence uh, between our tests and a, a, a sort of model confidence set approach where of course we do not have to set a benchmark. So. We can define a partial order between two forecasting methods uh, and note that it's gonna be partial here by construction because we have these conditional expectations. So J uh, is superior to K if the expected conditional loss uh, of model J is lower than the expected conditional loss of model K for all X. So using that ordering, we can define what we call a set of most superior methods as those models J that outperform all other models. So essentially what it means is that if we have a, uh, if we do the conditional superior predictability test with, for instance, one model against five alternatives, uh, if that model does not reject, or if the hypothesis does not reject there, then it 
should be in the set of most superior methods. And of course, what we can just do is apply the test to all six models individually. Uh, or with all six models as a different as a benchmark and rotate through all of it and if uh, we for instance do not reject two of those hypotheses then those are jointly together in the most in the set of most superior methods of course since we're dealing here with the, this partial ordering and indeed the fact that uh, we have these conditional expectations what can very well be is that all six hypotheses would be uh, rejected and there is an uh, a single uh, most superior method may not even exist because, of course, there's no reason to believe that there should always be a, a model uh, that outperforms all alternative models across all different states of the world. So you can, of course, and so uh, the set is very easily constructed by just indeed applying the test with all different benchmark models, um, and uh, uh, therefore it's it's kind of an, an easy extension. It differs, uh, or it's very similar to the model confidence set. Uh, which is essentially here. So the uh, model confidence set is, of course, essentially defined in the same way as uh, as, uh, as this set of the most superior, but with an empty conditioning variable. Note that the procedure there is quite different, and indeed, what they uh, uh, have proper size control on the set rather than on a, a point in the set, which is what we do. So there are some minor differences here, but uh, I still think this is uh, essentially this is still a very useful and uh, applicable way to think about this when we have many, many different models that we want to compare. OK, so now I'm quickly going to talk about uh, simulations to highlight how this test works. We have a, a J, capital J dimensional data generating process. The loss differences are going to be generated like this. Uh, so we have uh, two parameters in there, A and C. And we have an X process that uh, and that is going to be our conditioning variable. X is autocorrelated, simple AR1 model, and we have also have serial correlation in the residuals. Conditional expectation function looks like this. And importantly, uh, so this is how our two parameters work. It has a minimum one minus A. So when A is one where, or smaller than one, we're under the null. When A is greater than one, we're under the alternative. And uh, uh, C determines where the minimum is. So essentially what that uh, governs is the fact that we have a zero mean process here. Most uh, probability mass of X will be around zero. And the further we go away from that mean, uh, the less data points we have to construct inference around that minimum. So we expect power to decrease a little bit and to, to highlight that. So we consider different values for C, for rho, uh, and for A for the alternative, obviously. Uh, we consider a sample size of 100, 500, and 1,000, which uh, are chosen to sort of resemble quarterly, monthly, and daily data. And then we really get to how do we implement this in practice? Well, the set of basis functions that we use are Legendre polynomials on the rank transformed data. And uh, so the reason that we use this particular one is that um, the Legendre polynomials are or, uh, orthogonal to each other under uniform measure. And so by doing uh, this rank transformation essentially ensure that these polynomials will still be orthogonal and we don't run into any polynomial or multicoordinarity issues when the dimension of the problem really, really starts to increase. Um, polynomial order here is going to be selected uh, as follows. So it's going to be uh, the maximum of four and n to the power one fifth. So this ensures that we have at least cubic polynomials uh, since we start at the zeroth. And, uh, in uh, the larger data samples, we have more. So this is really what the data looks like. So these are the, the loss, so the red dots are the loss uh, differences that we estimate. The HJs are the conditional expected loss functions. So what I mainly want to highlight here is that the, uh, these loss differences are a little bit all over the place. You wouldn't necessarily decide whether or not it's zero based on this, based on just looking at the data. Um, here we have uh, top left uh, is under the null, top right is under the null, but with the shifted uh, minimum. And here we have two alternatives uh, right around the mean of X or again shifted. And this is uh, an example of what the test looks like in practice. So first, uh, so uh, which is actually equivalent or the practical implementation of the bottom right figure uh, that you see on this slide. So first we estimate the conditional expected loss function. So that's our HJ, that's this bottom black curve. 
Then we do our adaptive inequality selection. So we select a set of uh, points on this curve that we think contains the infimum with probability one and discard ones that are uh, poor alternatives. So the purple ones are the points that we select and the blue ones are the ones that we discuss and, or discard. And again, so this is to increase power uh, in our implementation because we can get our critical value lower the smaller this, this set is. Um, what's a little bit noteworthy here is that uh, we see here points that are actually lower or some purple points that are lower than uh, blue points or and uh, then or sorry are higher than some blue points and definitely here on the right tail we see many purple points that are much higher than blue tail but so here we cannot safely conclude that the, in the tails we cannot safely conclude that the infimum is not there simply because there the uncertainty around the estimates is a little bit larger and as such we do not discard those here but we do discard these parts that are more precisely estimated so given that set we get our critical value and then we can create our confidence bound so the confidence bound is the dashed line here and the conclusion here is that we reject the null hypothesis because uh, some part of the confidence bound is below zero and in particular what we get sort of as this byproduct is that we really see that somewhere between zero and 1.5 it seems that our model is significantly outperforming uh the alternative or our sorry our benchmark model is significantly beaten by the alternative model uh, and uh, the point estimates actually say that that range is a little bit wider. Okay, so if you do this many, many times, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to get. So uh, we indeed see that uh, this is on the null. So for the various sample sizes and everything, size is a little bit, uh, uh, we're a little bit undersized, we're conservative. But again, this is what we exactly what we would expect using normal hack inference. So with new West type estimators, we're slightly oversized, especially in small samples. Power curves look as follows. So here we are varying that A, so how deep the, the dip is in that curve. And we see power is increasing typically pretty rapidly. It is lower when there's more serial correlation in the residuals. Uh, it is lower when we're the minimum is further from the mean. So there's less probability mass of the uh, observations around that. So that is the top panel. I'm, uh, it's cheating a little bit, but still, I think it's helpful to understand what's going on. In the bottom panel, I show the, uh, the power curves for the unconditional superior predictive ability test. So obviously, uh, these hypotheses are different and they're not one to one. But within our DGP, invariably, when the alternative is bad enough, at some point, unconditional superior predictive ability hypothesis is also going to be false. Uh, and indeed, that happens as soon as I'm actually drawing the symbols in the curves. And I think the main thing that we that we like to highlight here is that essentially, by the, so if we're in such a situation, by the time uh, uh, we get there, that things we should be starting to reject. Our conditional superior predictability test is already almost essentially at 100% rejection rate. So we're, we've got a much more stringent hypothesis. We start to reject earlier. And typically when we have the unconditional superior predictability, then uh, uh, when that hypothesis is false, then the conditional one is definitely false as well. And uh, is much more powerful to distinct models. So, I can also show this with more than one alternative model and essentially the conclusion is uh, size is preserved and power increases with the more competing models we have. Okay, then in uh, my limited time left, I quickly want to show you some uh, empirical examples. So the first one is uh, finance, which I think is makes the most sense in this SOFI seminar. Uh, we used the data set of uh, Bollas, Left, Patton and Kvaslich on uh, from their uh, Exploring the Errors, the RQ paper. The set of realized volatilities uh, of the spider index in 27 Dow Jones stocks. So we're using a rolling window of 1,000 observations. Here we have 3,200 uh, losses. Uh, and we're going to be comparing six models, AR1, AR22, AR22, where we estimate the parameters with a lasso, uh, AR22, where we have this sort of economic restriction on the parameters, the hard type model, which uh, most of you will be uh, familiar with. HarQ is an extension that uh, varies the weight based on measurement error in the realized variance. And our FEMA is that fractionally integrated model that really tries to capture that long memory and realized volatility. We use this loss function based on the ratio. And as a conditioning variable here, as an example, we're going to be using the fix. So first results for unconditional superior predictability tests, showing average losses here. Uh, basically, we see that the AO1 performs absolutely very, very poorly. Uh, and the other models are uh, quite a bit closer. 
what we see is that uh, all the AR1 and HAR models are rejected in the one versus all models, essentially always. So there's always at least one model that is better than, uh, than these four models. Uh, for our FEMA, that's not entirely true. So that in 22 of the stocks, it's beaten by at least one model and the HAR-Q is beaten by at least one model in two cases. Uh, looking at the one versus one, we really see kind of a block structure where these, uh, these basic AR models. Um, so uh, let's see where the HAR and the HAR-Q in our FEMA models essentially are never beaten by the basic AR models. Uh, whereas the AR1 and AR models are essentially always beaten by the HAR and HAR-Q type models. But now for the C-SPOT test, because of course that's what we're interested in here. Uh, I want to start with, before showing you the full results for all the uh, stocks, I want to show you a little bit of a case study. And for that, I'm going to be using Johnson & Johnson. I'm starting with just a one versus one test. So I use here as benchmark the HAR model and an alternative one, the AR1. On the y-axis, we have the loss differential. On the x-axis, we have the VIX. And basically, what we see, the conditional expected loss function uh, is kind of in line with what we would expect. The HAR model tends to perform much, much better. But somewhat interestingly, we see that when the VIX is very high, the AR1 model uh, starts to perform a lot better. So the point estimate is actually negative. It's not significant, but uh, most of the gains of the HAR versus an AR1 really tend to be in the low VIX periods. Uh, on the right, we have a uh, different version. So HAR is again, benchmark alternative is HAR-Q. So what we see here is that the conditional expected loss function is negative across all values of the VIX. Uh, and it's significantly negative uh, between about, uh, what is it, 13 and 20. Uh, so in this region, we see that the HAR-Q significantly outperforms the HAR model. And in this case, indeed, we would reject the hypothesis for HAR. If we do it with multiple models at the same time, so this is the one versus all. On the left-hand side, I use this benchmark an AR1 model. And what we see here is that, uh, indeed, for again, for low values of the VIX, the AR1 model is beaten by almost or by all the models uh, and quite poorly, but for high levels of the VIX, its performance is basically uh, on par or even potentially a little bit better than uh, most of the alternative models. And uh, here we see on the right-hand side, if we have the benchmark model HAR-Q, we see that its conditional expectation function is essentially hovering around zero at all times, which means that uh, jointly, the five alternative models, uh, one model is typically performing about the same level as the HAR-Q, but there's not a single model essentially that is always outperforming it, or not even a combination of models that is always outperforming it. And indeed, the confidence bound is also strictly above zero. So this is kind of a, a visualization that helps you uh, understand the, when the models are performing quite well. And indeed, uh, to us, it was quite surprising that uh, we saw that the AO1 performance being quite a bit better in, in high fixed times. And indeed, when we look at the total results, uh, we also see that back in, in strict uh, rejection uh, frequencies, where now indeed we see that the AR1 sometimes actually beats the HAR and the HAR-Q uh, in certain scenarios. And indeed, that's then really driven by the, these high VIX periods. Apart from that, we see slightly more frequent rejections, uh, but the overall qualitative conclusion here uh, in terms of relative model ranking is still very similar. Finally, then, uh, before I wrap up. Roger, if I can interrupt, we're sort of a little bit over time. So if you could wrap it up in the next minute or so. Yes, I'll do it very quickly. Okay. So thank you for interrupting me. Um, so inflation forecasting, very quick. One month inflation forecasting, and here we're looking at different uh, uh, conditioning variables. The main thing that I want to show you here is that we're in a situation with different models where uh, we really end up with a short list that based on unconditional evaluation, we can no longer really distinct these top four models that we have here. <clears throat> but indeed, we typically are able to find uh, a conditioning variable on which we do find uh, significant differences between these models and we can reject some of these. So this is a situation where this, uh, these conditional superior predictability tests may really help you uh, in uh, in distincting models where unconditional ones are unable to. So uh, for more details, I'll happily refer you to the paper. And on that, uh, then I'll end. So we propose a test for conditional superior predictability. 
we have this functional inference approach and uh, in order to do that properly we make some new theoretical contributions in the form of a new strong approximation theory for mixing gills that is considerably weaker than the, the existing one and uh, we have also have some results on high dimensional hack estimation the test is quite difficult to pass uh, if your new model uh, meant or actually passes it uh, i think it's i would be quite happy uh, and finally, we have these two applications, finance and macro, uh, that mainly show that sort of unconditionally indistinguishable models may still differ quite strongly in conditional performance. So this really helps us uh, fine tune uh, and understand models a little bit better. And on that, I'll end. So thank you for your attention and sorry for running a bit late. Thanks very much, Roger. That was great. Thank you. Okay, now we'll turn it over to the discussant, Peter Hansen. All right, so I should have unmuted myself now. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Very good. So we tried to do full screen before we got started here, but then it was showing two pages at once. I think I have the screen is a little too wide. So we'll, we'll do it in this way here. So first of all, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to discuss uh, Roger's paper here. Uh, it was sort of a blast from the past in some way and a lot of new stuff, uh, you know, going back to you know, almost the time where we hang out in grad school. Uh, I remember Hal White presenting his paper, a reality check in 98, and I was super excited when I saw that paper. And Andrew was there too, I'm sure. So uh, I'm first gonna talk a little bit about uh, superior predictability and and some of the things that, that are deep in that problem that that occasionally is, is overlooked or misunderstood. So, trying to sort of follow the notation that Roger had. Um, uh, this is the expect the loss difference and we want to test hypotheses about this. Uh, in the superior predictability setup, uh, there's a benchmark and you're comparing things to the benchmark. And the null hypothesis is that nothing beats the benchmark. That is uh, the superior predictability uh, null hypothesis is this. And of course, you can formulate it in this way here, or you can formulate it by stacking all the elements of mu on top of each other and testing it at once. But this way of expressing it sort of conceals what we're after. We're not specifically after rejecting that null. I mean, there are more powerful ways of doing that than what we are doing. We want to know why it is rejected. We want to know which alternative beats the benchmark. And that makes it a little bit difficult and uh, different from, from sort of a typical problem where you know, this is the hypothesis of interest. Is, is it false or is it not? What is the evidence? But there will be cases where we can reject this, but we don't know why. You know? and, and the reason we don't go about this, this is sort of the reason why we don't use quadratic form test. We sort of want to put it into something that will tell us which J was the reason. The analogy I like to use when I teach this is, you know, it's just like, it's much easier to figure out that a murder has been committed than to figure out who committed the murder. Uh, so that is, you know, here you can, you can reject the null hypothesis, but that's, you know, easier than to figure out why, uh, you know, someone got killed and who did it. So, you know, maybe you know that the Orient Express, you know. So, how do, we, how do we go about that? Well, we sort of construct a test statistic that is based on the individual, the marginal distributions on, the, on each dimension. So in this case, we'll have distributions that are specific to alternative J being compared with the benchmark. And we can either combine, you know, some statistic of that form, it could be a p-value, then we'll take minimum instead. But basically we do this, and then this is our test statistic, and then we derive the distribution of that under the null hypothesis. And then if we then reject, if we have a case where the test statistic exceeds the critical value, then we know that all the alternatives for which the individual or marginal test statistic was greater than the critical value, they are significantly better than the benchmark. That's what we can conclude. Then, you know, after having done that, we can actually proceed and do it again. There was uh, Romano and Wolf has a paper where they do a sequential procedure 
where they where they might be able to identify additional ones. Um, all right. So the limit experiment, and this is sort of going back to white, uh, is the following. Uh, we want to test uh, this hypothesis. And the limit, this is sort of the information we have. We have a vector from multivariate normal where, with some unknown mu's and some unknown omegas. But in the limit, we'll estimate those. And, and we'll get those and then conduct inference about the mu's. And what did uh, Hal White do? Well, he, uh, he said, let me take the largest element from this vector here. And you know, so it has a you know, marginal normal distribution like this, uh, different mu's, different variances. And then the null distribution, uh, he then, you know, this is a composite hypothesis. There are many ways that the null is true. So you have to pick one value and you want to control size. And the way this was conventionally done was by using what's called the least variable configuration. So you know, the point least variable to the alternative and so forth. So in this case, that is the vector of zeros. So you basically pretend that the true value is zero or vector of zeros here. And then you derive the distribution of your test statistic under that distribution here. That's what's happening in the limit. And you can either do, you know, in Hal White's paper, he both proposed to do Monte Carlo sim simulations or to do a bootstrap implementation that you know, was uh, very convenient. Now, the problem with this is that taking max here and recentering has a very unfortunate uh, property uh, that shows itself in applications. And that is, for example, if you just have two, com you're comparing two things to the benchmark, then you have something that is maybe equally good as the benchmark. So you get a draw from that distribution around zero. And then you have something that is much worse. Uh, it also has some more wide distribution, but it doesn't really matter. The critical value is here. So there's like 5% chance to reject the null if you use the true distribution, but you don't know that mu one is zero and mu two is minus six. On the least favorable configuration, what you do is you recenter things. And basically this white tail distribution gets shifted all the way up to the right. And now it's defining the critical values, unfortunately. And um, uh, so here you have uh, what the critical value would be in this case uh, instead. So it dominates the, the, the critical value and you lose a lot of power. I mean, so the, this blue shade is, could have been further to the right and you wouldn't be able to reject it with very high probability. You know, initially zero probability, it'll take a while before you get any power whatsoever. So that was the problem with, with this uh, approach. So what can you do? Well, there's not one remedy, there are two remedies to this. So one is, as, as Roger was saying, is something about getting rid of the poor stuff, but not quite getting rid of the poor stuff. That's, that's not what I proposed. I proposed to, you know, you basically use least favorable configuration if the you know, observations are sufficiently close to zero. And so this was similar to, to this threshold that Roger was showing. But if you have a, a very negative value here, well, then you just leave it as that. So you don't completely throw it away. It's still gonna be there. And you, you know, of course, if you really know what probability is zero that it's inferior, then you, know, you could it would be the same as entirely. But in finite samples, this could play a role. And so you might still want to leave it in. So that was one thing. The other thing I, I proposed was to studentize. You basically want to, you don't want to compare apples and, and oranges. Uh, so first bring things on the same scale. That's another way of, of you know, both things are helpful for this problem. And um, so you can use t-statistics. You could also compute the p-values here and then do the minimum p-value. And then uh, let's see here, I guess I forgot to delete something on this slide here. Anyway, you know, I often read, um, anyway, there's two things in the paper that, that needs to be done. And anyway, so uh, what is this paper about? Well, so they do a lot of interesting innovations. Uh, so it's about conditional uh, expectations instead. So you have to come up with some X variable and basically what are you gonna use? Well, that's gonna vary from time to time. Um, and you no, know, you turn the inequality around, that, that's okay. I had to go back and check Y to see if I had turned it around, but maybe you wanna switch this around so you, you know, follow the literature, but it's not important. Um, I had a question about timing. When is XT? 
So in your application, it's the time the forecast is made, but you could also use it for things that are realized after. And the notation suggests that that's what you could do as well. So, so that's that's a question I have, and I have some comments on that at the very end. Um, now, an issue you have early on is, you know, it sort of goes away with assumption, but but a conditional expectation like that is 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 poorly defined, right? You can you can mess that up as much as you like on sets of measure zero, and you don't, you know, still a conditional expectation. So it's probably better to initially formulate it in some way like this, uh, acknowledging that this is a random variable and then say almost everywhere, almost surely as, as is commonly done. I think also Jim Kamini and White did it in this way here, um, but I forgot to check. Um, because then you don't, you know, get around this this uh, definition issue. Then the question is, is this defined at, at all? Well, it. It still is, you know, once you, uh, you choose your basis functions and, and think about the limit, then this guy is still there. So, so, so nothing breaks down. It's just a matter of, of formulating it. I really like this figure here because that's uh, super useful for understanding what's going on. So basically we're comparing two different forecasting models. And then we ask, you know, given the VIX, when do we see one model outperform the other or not? And, you know, in one case, uh, the AR1 is sort of getting beaten you know, clearly here, but m maybe, maybe not over here. And the same thing with, with the, the Haas being beaten by the Ha Q uh, here a lot, but maybe, maybe not over here. Um, but this also sort of shows how, how you know, you're really making the requirement very, very stringent by requiring it, the conditional mean to be strictly on one side all the way uh, through. Uh, not caring about how low the probabilities are here, here, or how likely these outcomes are, how many observations we have, perhaps. But um, you know, regardless of that, I think it's still interesting to see, even when they cross, because they can guide us to to construct better forecasts, to do model averaging, you know, different scenarios. There's so many useful things you could do with that. Now, uh, conditional, unconditional. Well, usually it, we always sort of have to map conditional means into some unconditional version. You know, could also use kernel functions, uh, use spaces function instead. Um, and, and this is something people have done, right? Where they use an indicator function or a subsample that says that. The problem here is of course that the finer we do it, the more basis functions you have, you know, the few observations you have, you know, for the number of things you're testing, you know, it's just a continuum of, 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 of hypothesis all the time. And uh, it makes it sort of difficult to sort of establish firm uniformity, uh, dominance uh, in that sense. Um, and, uh, you know, that. so I don't think sort of the determining uniformity of you know, dominance is the important part. You know, estimating that conditional mean is very interesting. And can be used for many more things than 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 what you're currently doing. For example, there could be cases, interesting cases where the uniformity is reject. No, sorry, is uh, uh, it's not rejected, but the condition. Yes, yeah, so the uniform is not rejected. Or the unconditional is not rejected, but the conditional is, as you have in the simulation study. Um, that will be guiding. Now the definition of, of superior, so this is also where you sort of get a little bit stuck on this very stringent requirement. So here, the set of superior models is the blue line because it has the smallest conditional, it always has a smaller conditional loss than the other one. But then if you're comparing three models and there's a red line that is almost worse, but then down here, it just dips down between the other ones. Now your set becomes empty, you know, in, in, the, in the population. And that's sort of an, an odd uh, choice. Um, so let me just round up here with uh, with this. So I don't think that the conditional superiority is, is the most interesting part of the paper. It is estimating this conditional mean and thinking about what we can use it for. Now we can use it, we can condition on variables we have at the time where we make the forecast. That would be useful for seeing if our forecast is, is satisfying some basic efficiency conditions. Uh, have we neglected uh, information that we should have had in there? Have we neglected, neglected uh, some nonlinearities, perhaps some you know, misspecification of sorts? Uh, and your, your empirical application with the HQ is, is, is super uh, good for illustrating that. It could also be used to, to say maybe we should switch between different models 
given x. You know, it may also be that we use a future value of x to condition on, and that would help us understand what is the cause some forecast to fail or, or you know, to to be disappointing in the outcomes because we see, you know, maybe it's when you know inflation got high or you know some condition variables that we don't know at the time we made the forecast, but we can use them to understand scenarios in which things fail or succeed. And so I also thought that would be a very interesting application of it. So I really like this, this idea of estimating this conditional mean, and I think there's so many things you could do with it. And, and yeah, I don't think you have to put yourself into this conditional superior predictive uh, you know, hat, because even when that is not satisfied, when you have them turn and sometimes this and that, it's still very interesting. And there's so many things that could be used for. Yeah, so that's what I had to say. All right, thanks very much, Peter. Great. Well, we're a little running a little bit late, so maybe I think what we should do is, Roger, if you'd like to offer some replies, if you if you choose, and then we'll end the official seminar and we'll move over to the hangout session where we can ask questions and and stuff. And there's a there's a couple already in the chat, so we there's some to be had there. So, Roger, if you'd like to respond. Yeah, well, Peter, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, also for the, the history lesson, I wasn't quite around yet back then uh, when those first papers came out. Um, uh, just about, but uh, yeah. I, uh, I had quite some other interests at that, at that point. Yeah. Um, no, but uh, uh, thanks for those, those encouraging comments and uh, also definitely seeing sort of the, the bigger picture of all the things that we might be able to do with this. Uh, I think for now, I'm, I'm just going to focus on the timing stuff because that's the thing that's gripping me most right now. So indeed, we've been doing uh, strictly lagged variables uh, with the purpose of indeed thinking about, okay, we're doing a forecasting model here and then uh, somehow learning about what we could have done uh, at that point in time. Uh, indeed, we've even done some of that. Uh, we've tested a little bit with that switching forecasting and uh, results were not even... Uh, or we're quite encouraging actually, but uh, we wanted to focus on the test. Um, but those ideas of uh, contemporaneous or potentially future uh, is super interesting. And I think uh, definitely a great application of all the uh, sort of the methods that were developed here. Uh, and uh, sort of one final thing indeed on the stringency of the test. I think that's also a very fair point. Uh, and for instance, that example you gave with our and the empty set that you might happen with such a sort of a, a tail scenario, where very far in the right tail of the conditioning variable, you get a switch. I think the the advantages, and I think it's related to it why we switched around the the null, why our uh, equality sign changed, is that indeed here we're not going to be rejecting typically in these very far tail cases because they're. It's very little data there. The conditional expectation function is uh, estimated a lot less precisely. And typically we have quite a large standard error around that, those parts of the regions. Uh, so most of the rejections will come in the center of the conditioning variable where we have, uh, um, where we have slightly more power. And uh, so I think in that sense, the, the stringency of the test doesn't necessarily, uh, I mean, yes, it is very, very stringent. We also purposely put it there as very, very stringent, but I think the nice bit is that, uh, or at least we see in practice, uh, it's not always rejected. So, uh, uh, and I think that's that helps a lot in the way that we switched the hypothesis. Uh, and on that, I'll, I'll, I'll end it. And, uh, yeah. and thank you and uh, great discussion. All right. Thanks very much, Roger. And thank you, Peter, for the discussion. Everyone, please stick around. Before we end the official seminar, though, let me do a brief advertisement for the next Sophie seminar. Next Sophie seminar will be in two weeks' time, April 19th. The speaker will be Christian Guru Roo. So I'm trying to average out the, uh, the ages of our speakers. Roger may not have been born long, 1998. I know Christian was. And he's discussing will be Anders Rabeck uh, from University of Copenhagen. So please join us in two weeks' time for, for the next Sophie seminar.